uh, uh, talk about uh, our, uh, the sons of Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. Now, we left the note this morning kind of looking like it's kind of bleak for Esau. Uh, some people says Esau didn't get one blessing, but even though he begged his father for it, I still see where there was hope that Esau might be blessed because God is a righteous God. It's just that he did not believe that that birthright was of any importance to him uh, when he made that bargain with Jacob. Counted as nothing, not worthy. All of a sudden when the time came, as I was coming to that point this morning, uh, when the time came, uh, Jacob got the blessing. The phrase is used, Esau stowed, uh, or rather Jacob stowed Esau's blessing. Jacob didn't steal it. He bargained with, he bargained with Esau, sell me this day your birthright, and I'll give you some of the stew. And he said, well, what is that to me? Kind of made, you know, kind of like jokingly. You know, when we think about Jacob and Esau at this time, we're thinking about teenagers. Uh-uh. They was 40 years old at this time. They had not left home yet. And you think Jacob, timing went and met uh, uh, Leah and uh, also Rachel. You'd think Jacob was pretty young. No, he was 60 years old. And so there's a lot of years went by there. And uh, so, you know, I always thought about these as younger men, but uh, they had a lot of years behind them. And so Jacob got the blessing. Jacob ran for his life, which we studied this morning. And what I wanted to go to is there uh, during this 20 years that he worked for his uncle Laban, uh, Laban changed Jacob's wages 10 times. Less and less every time. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't want to get things going to, you know, start it, but I heard when a new manager came in to, to the store that all of them got their wages cut. So, you know, sometimes, sometimes they may think it's going to help them, but sometimes it don't. But Jacob had something keeping him there, and that was Rachel, because Jacob loved Rachel. And when the time came, Jacob worked seven years for Rachel and Rachel's father and Rachel's sister and Rachel seemed to know about what was going on because whenever Jacob woke up after this feast which they had the next day it wasn't Rachel that was there or it wasn't Leah, excuse me, but it was Rachel. Uh, I got mixed up. It wasn't, it wasn't Rachel, but it was Leah. And so that's not who he wanted. He didn't want Leah. He loved Rachel. She was beautiful, had good body features and everything what a man wants to look at. Oftentimes, somebody's pretty and got a good figure. But you know, you're looking in the wrong place. But that's all you're looking at. And so the custom was, Jacob found out later that the oldest daughter had to be married first. Couldn't let the youngest one be married. So it was Leah. Uh, Leah had to go as someone that was loved much less than her sister, Rachel. So 
we find that uh, Jacob worked another seven years uh, for Rachel. And uh, then he worked six more years for the livestock and, and the animals which he'd take with him. So he was there for 20 years of his life. And when he got ready to leave, he took Rachel and Leah, had 11 children falling behind, had a, other men servants, maid servants, had a large bunch of, uh, 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 you might say sheep or cattle or whatever they may have had. And he was really just about rich. And he left Laban with practically nothing. His father-in-law. You know, they say what goes around comes around. Reap what you sow. And Laban had cheated uh, Jacob. Jacob had also cheated. Amen. But what's in store for Esau? That's what I wanted us to look at for a little while. So uh, Jacob leaves with a large possession uh, when he leaves his father-in-law. He was chased down by his father-in-law because somebody had stole his, his father-in-law's gods. And they were little trinkets and ornaments and things that people would worship. And so he called up with them and asked, why did you take, it's bad enough that you took, you know, my possessions, but why did you take my gods? And Jacob said, if you find them here, the, the person that is calling possession of them, that we, they're going to pay for it with their life. But what Jacob didn't know, Rachel stole her father's gods. And you know how that she had this, they had this saddle that went on the back of a camel and it had pockets and places to carry things. And she had those gods in there. And she brought that saddle to her tent. And she found out her father was searching the camp for the gods that she had. So, anyway, under the law, it was unclean to touch a woman that was within her monthly. And so, therefore, Rachel sat on top of that saddle as her father began to search for everything. And she told him that she was at that time of month and that, you know, he could look. He was satisfied not to. And so there was those things that, that he was satisfied he left. But when Jacob left, he left with a big company of people. As I said, he wrestled with the Lord. Amen. And because he was fixing to meet his brother. He heard that Esau was coming with 400 men. And the last he heard from Esau, that Esau was threatening to take Jacob's life. Uh, 20 years had passed. And now the Bible said here in Genesis chapter 33, and Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, and Leah and her children after that, and Rachel and Joseph behind. And he passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Remember the heated argument that they had and how Esau hated Jacob. But you know, when they came together, the Bible said that Esau ran to meet him. Isn't this wonderful? And embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. You might be surprised sometimes what a little time can do for healing bad relationships. 
You know, sometimes we're too hasty. There's people that will kill somebody in their haste. And, and you know, in a heated argument, it's a bad time to fight. And so things had changed with Jacob. He had been blessed. But come to find out, so had Esau. So Esau lifted up his eyes, saw the women and the children that Jacob was bringing with him, and said, Who are those with thee? And Jacob said, The children which God has graciously given thy servant. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. They bowed themselves to Esau. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves before Esau. And Esau said, What meanest thou by all this droll which I meant? Because uh, uh, we find that uh, Jacob had sent before presents ahead of time to be delivered unto Esau, thinking it might cool Esau's wrath. What does this mean? And, and Jacob said, These are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. So you see, things was different in this meeting than it was in the last. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. So what had happened, God had also blessed Esau. And keep that thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face. Listen how he describes it. What he said to Esau, I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God. And thou was pleased with me. And so Jacob said, I want you to take this blessing that I brought unto you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. And he urged him and he took it. And he said, let us take our journey and let us go and I will go before thee. And he said unto him, my Lord knoweth that the children are tender. In other words, Esau would be traveling a lot faster with his herdsmen than Jacob would because Jacob had fled from his father-in-law Laban and he had a whole bunch of children and uh, probably some grandchildren and uh, a host of uh, servants and he was quite a multitude there and so they would have to drive slow you know the animals with the big flocks which he had to let to let them eat uh, of, of the grass and the food along the way and so uh, Jacob told him I can't do this because I might overdrive this animals and the flock will all die. So there's no way I can travel at your speed, Esau. I can't keep up with you. But he said, I pray, pass over before the servant, and I will lead on softly, according as, as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure until I come unto my Lord unto Seir. And Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me and he said what needed who needed it let me find grace in the sight of my lord you know what what jacob wanted more than anything else was to get back fellowship with his brother and his brother was looking at the same way that's my brother and i love him and that's a wonderful that's the good part of the story and so Esau returned that day on his way to Seir, and Jacob journeyed to Sechoth and built him a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore the name of the place is called Sechoth. 
Now, I want to go to the book of Malachi, and I want to explain some misunderstood scriptures by a lot of people. People. So that you will understand how God looked at this situation. It's not how they looked at it with one another, but how did God look at it? How was God going to deal with Esau? And so in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, that was chapter 1, verse. One, two, three. Okay. Malachi chapter one. Said the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel of Malachi. Now, I want you to know that by this time, uh, those that were descendants of Esau, they were known as Edomites. Edom. And there have been a lot of years passed by from the time these brothers came back in their fellowship one with another. So they became tribes and tribes were named after the fathers. And of course Esau was red and they called him Edom. And there was a country named after Esau Edom and they called them the Edomites. And then the word of the Lord came to Malachi. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. And that's what I want you to look. This word of the Lord came to Israel. Now again, I want you to look at it like this. Uh, Jacob's name was named Israel. But all of his descendants were called Israel as a nation. They became the nation of Israel. Even today, they are known as Israel. Amen. And so, therefore, when we talk about Israel, it's not talking about one man here. It's talking about a multitude of people that have become a nation. So Israel has become a nation with many, many people. And so had... Uh, 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 we find that uh, Esau also became many people. And here's what God said. I have loved you, said the Lord. Who's he talking to? He's talking to Israel right here. I have loved you, said the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother said the Lord yet I love Jacob now and I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness and so uh, we find as uh, the descendants of Esau grew and became a nation and they began to serve other gods. And God was saying, I hate this. I hate you for what you have done. And the word hate is not always in the way we understand hate. Sometimes hate means rejected or not being used for the purpose that God wants to use you that he has chose someone else over you. It did not literally mean that he hated them because God is love. And we still teach today, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But he said, I hated Esau and I laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom said, and this is Esau, his descendants, not Esau the individual. We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places, thus saith the Lord of hosts. 
They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. And your eyes shall see and you shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. So what God was saying, the love that I had towards you should be should make you understand from what you have read in the scripture, I love Jacob, but I hated Israel. That means God chose Jacob. It's a matter of choice. I choose you. I reject you. And it goes on even when people become very weak and evil. People have actually been destroyed. But I want to go just a little bit further here. In the book of Romans chapter 9, And we want to read some more about that. Romans chapter 9. Alright. And it said in verse 10, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, and there we're talking about something big, we're talking about the elect, which God can predestinate because of his foreknowledge. He knows what you're going to do before you do it. And because he knows what you're going to do to the foreknowledge of God, he can predestinate. In other words, he can pre, uh, predetermine your destination before it ever gets here. God can predetermine that. And neither child as babies had done good or evil. And that the purpose of God according to election. Now, we're talking about election, what God has chose, what God has elected. We had no part in it. We had no say. We didn't get the vote on it. It was God that through His election, according to His election, might stand not of works, but of Him that calleth. And we need to realize today that in the New Testament that we're not saved by our works. And we need to realize there's none save one that is the Father. And we need to realize that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We need to realize that without the righteousness of Jesus Christ and His shed blood upon the cross of Calvary, every person would be lost. But He bore our sins and His blood was shed that we might be saved. That's how much He loved us. That He might have the elect, not our righteousness, but His righteousness. And so He said unto her, the elder, shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have a love, but Esau have a hated. And again, I want you to understand that God chose Jacob. While even before they were in the womb, before either child had done good or evil, that God chose Jacob, uh, not Esau. And I know sometimes this is hard for people to understand. And so he said, Jacob have a love, but Esau have a hated. And that word hate, I'm going to explain it to you a little more and tell you uh, how that we have to uh, hate certain things ourselves. What shall we say then? If there, if, if their unrighteousness is there unrighteousness with God? Because God can say this one's going to be blessed and this one here is not. Is there unrighteousness with God? But God, through His predestination and through His foreknowledge, 
He knows the path that we're going to take. And he knows what we're going to choose. And so there he said, for he said to Moses, okay, first of all, let's get 14. For what shall I say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? I mean, you, you look at this, you might get confused. Well, this is not right. God lets this person do this. God will not let that person do it. But it's an elect. It's whom God has elected and whom God has called. And God said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. It is God's choice. We read where some are met with swift destruction because of their sin and they were destroyed. We find others that were given an opportunity to repent of their sins. And who are we to question God? Amen. When is there unfaithfulness with God? Amen. Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. There was another man, and he deals with it in the scripture. That God said unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up. But before God's foreknowledge, God would know there would come a wicked Pharaoh that would put the children of Israel into bondage. And so God brought Pharaoh to the place, the highest position that there was. And he got to the place, remember, that he was having all of the male babies killed and throw into the Nile River. And if you'll remember how the mother of Moses, how she had this baby Moses, and she wove together a basket pitched with mud inside and out because she wanted her baby to be saved. Now Aaron was already born, probably about three years old at that time. And we find Marion would be born later. Uh, but here was the baby Moses that when the, when the women would be delivered of their babies, these uh, the ones that would take the babies, the Egyptian women, were supposed to kill them if they, you know, if it's a male child. But Moses' mother, she uh, put this basket together and put it there in the river. And by chance, you might say by chance, God's will was being done. Amen. And Pharaoh's daughter was washing herself and there at the bank of the river. And here was this little basket. And she heard the voice of a baby crying. And they brought the basket to the, to the bank there and then hooked. And there was a, a male child, a baby. And they recognized it as a Hebrew. And just, you might say as chance, but it wasn't as chance. It was all in the plan of God. Amen. That was, that was one there. Amen. The sister of Moses are, are, that said, uh, you want me to go find a mother uh, to nurse this baby? Amen. And said, yes. And she went and got her own mother. And she raised her up. And God said concerning Pharaoh, for this cause, as the scripture has said, this same purpose I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that thy name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. You know, there's some hardened criminals that have stood before the judge, and there have been some that have been sentenced to death. They used to hang them. In the other ways, you had an electric chair, and you know, the death sentence. 
but somebody else somewhere or another, maybe just as guilty as they, some way they got by and did not have to suffer the death penalty. But we find here that uh, Moses was spared. Amen. And so Pharaoh was going to be used as a puppet in the hand of God. And through Pharaoh, though he had, been, had raised to a high position, God sent Moses back. Amen. Which they had been in slavery and in bondage for 430 years. And God spoke to Moses. said, I want you to go to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. For I've heard their cries. And Moses went before Pharaoh. I'm just make it short, you know that. Amen. Without going into great detail. How that through Moses the ten plagues came. And, and the last one was the death of the firstborn son. Amen. Wherever the blood of the lamb was not upon the side post or upper post of the home. Amen. If it wasn't there, the firstborn would die in every house. Amen. And how that God would harden Pharaoh. Remember he told Moses before, he said, yeah, I'm going to let you go. But, but the next day he said, no. Then he said, yes. Then he said, no. He kept hardening his heart. Amen. And so, so what do you think? What will you say unto me? Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but old man, who art thou? That replies against God. Shall the thing formed say to him that was formed, Why hast thou made me thus? Had not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? There was a scripture, and I didn't write it down, and uh, I know that Jesus said this. I couldn't hear exactly where it is right now. It's in my, in my mind. I said, I don't need to write this down. I remember this. But uh, I remember that Jesus said to his disciples, except you hate your father and your mother and your brothers and your sister and your children, you're not worthy to go to... You're not worthy you know, to inherit the kingdom of God. Now see, if you take that literally, it would sound like that you're supposed to hate in the sense that we would say hate. But when he used the word hate here, he means that we must choose God first. We must love our father and our mother and so the way it was used is saying we, we must love them less than we love God. We must love God more. The highest form of love that we can give, give it to God first. And unless we're willing to do that, we're not worthy of the kingdom of God. And the word is used unless you hate. And so don't, don't misunderstand that scripture. Because the Lord said, Honor thy father and thy mother. And Jesus said, Love thy neighbor as thyself. And he talked about the fruits of the Spirit. And one of them on the top of the list was love. There was faith, also hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity. Amen. So what he's saying is not hate in the sense that we would use it. But it means that we must God must love God first. We must put Him first. If you remember, a good teaching of that is back when the prophet of God, Elijah, came to the widow's house and people were starving to death, and she had enough just meal to make two cakes, cakes and a little bit of oil. And how that uh, Elijah the prophet came and he asked her. Or something to eat. And she said, I've just got this, and me and my son's going to eat it, and we're going to die. And you know what Elijah said? First, fix a cake for me. And this is, this is to me an example of how God is saying he must be first. 
in our life. And she went and she made that cake for Elijah, for him, and then for her and her son. And in her oil barrel, they never got low. And her meal and her cooking stuff that she had never got low. She survived the whole way through. God will take care of you. So, so I wanted to clarify that from this morning. And I'm going to kind of close with that. I just wanted to let you know that it's on an individual basis how God is going to deal with you. Now, sometimes innocent people suffer, but God didn't cause it. They suffer because of war. Look at Ukraine right now as an example. The war on civilians, killing them by the hundreds and hundreds. They have no pity, no mercy. It's like it's a, just like the life of an animal. So they have no feelings whatsoever. And they don't care who they murder whatsoever. Amen. And so we see a whole nation, a whole nation is suffering. And it's those people, some of those people, they don't deserve it. Does anybody actually deserve that? Amen. And so God is just telling us to love one another. But first of all, love him above all else. Amen. And I just want everyone to keep praying for the situation in Ukraine. Wars is a terrible, terrible thing. To think that they have enough uh, nuclear weapons probably to destroy the whole world. Uh, Joel describes the horror of nuclear warfare in what he writes. And he talked about the flesh would consume away and how their eye sockets would consume away their eyes and the flesh would melt. Amen. Joel talks about it, a time of war in this nuclear warfare. And folks, we're living in a dangerous time that we're living in. But just remember, you have that choice to make as an individual. God's not going to punish you because your child didn't listen to you and went astray. Amen. God loves you. And I believe today that He looks at us on an individual basis. Amen. How is your heart? How do you feel about God? Do you love God more than anything else? And I'm going to close with that for the comment.